We're glad you're here with us for Inside the Courtroom, the Chad Daybell trial. So this week we got to see the defense. The defense presented uh, their uh, evidence, their testimony. We heard from the defendant's daughter, uh, her husband. We also heard from Chad Daybell's son. And we also heard from a forensic DNA expert. So Greg Hampikian, he is a professor at Boise State University, well known uh, across the country and, and maybe even internationally as a forensic DNA expert. And so he has done lots of work with the Innocence Project and uh, was on the stand really to talk about how DNA is spread. I think he used the word shedding. We talked about all of the different pieces and parts of our body are you know whether it's from saliva and and skin um, how much uh, evidence I guess we leave uh, just in our functioning throughout the day and the defense attorney John Pryor questioned him about would it be unusual I think trying to paint the picture that if in fact Chad Daybell was involved or was responsible for the death of JJ and Tylee that you would expect to see DNA evidence there at the scene in the in the uh, the whether it be from the fire pit um, or from the the pieces of evidence that they collected that were involved that they believe were involved in both JJ and Tylee's deaths um, so interesting to see it'll be interesting to see how jurors take that information uh, certainly those uh, children uh, the, the son-in-law the daughter the son uh, very very um, supportive of Chad Daybell did talk about their mom or mother-in-law being ill and having some uh, some health problems prior to her death things that we've heard uh, from chad daybell's uh, defense attorney but yet has been countered by a lot of the witnesses that the prosecution put on the stand saying in fact they had not seen uh, any evidence of um, her health issues and so it'll be interesting to see how jurors weigh that out to help us understand a little bit more about how jurors take in this information we're actually joined now by tom evans who was a juror in the lori vallow case so a year ago you sat in that same uh, courthouse uh, listened to very similar evidence You've now decided, you chose at the start of this trial to be here for Chad Daybell. So talk me through kind of that thought process of when did you know and how did you know that you wanted to, to listen in this time around? Well, it, it started at the beginning of the Lori Vallow trial. I went into it uh, not wanting to be there. Mm -hmm. um, it was depressing, it was dark, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, and by the time I had sat through that trial and it was over, I actually, began to have a lot of respect for the system, mm -hmm. um, for the prosecution, the defense, uh, the court system, the police, and I felt myself being honored yeah. to have been a part of it. And I wanted to tell that story. Right. And I wanted to do something, I wanted to try to get something good out of it. Mm -hmm. So I decided to write a book about that trial Okay. and donate the proceeds to a charity that helps children. Mm -hmm. Um, so that kind of got me started thinking about it right. and then I'm done with that book okay and um, but there's so much more to tell interesting and I couldn't just walk away from it right we're ready to just let it go right yeah so I decided I need to do a little bit more comprehensive book on the second trial okay it's actually about both trials, I guess. Sure, um, kind of the combination or that the story yeah, that's being told. Yeah. So tell me, sitting in there, um, you went through and listened to every uh, every witness. I mean, you were there for every bit of that testimony, obviously, during during the first trial. Is anything this time different? Is there anything that has caught you by surprise? Nothing's really caught me by surprise. It's basically the same Right. evidence but there's just more of it and more of it that's tying chad in mm -hmm. and i think the prosecution is focusing a little bit more on tammy yeah because that's their best way to tie chad in sure that's the one you know i know that in Lori's trial you heard a little bit about about tammy but really it was more the conspiracy right so that yeah. all you had to worry about was did she have some awareness of it right we knew she wasn't there we know that she wasn't that yeah. Lori was not uh, in town at the time of tammy's death so you didn't have to hear all of that. Right. What about like things like the jail phone call? I know in a couple of episodes ago, we, we played that, the phone call when Lori was in jail, talking to Chad and, and talking about the, the renovation project and, and how things don't always go the way you planned, but she was hoping that things would be good. You didn't hear that during right. the first trial. Did that give you any pause or was that, any, was that insightful at all? A little bit. I mean, it, it, it's just one of, one of the many things added on to mm -hmm. kind of bolster their case, I think. Okay. 
Yeah, but more than that, I think the um, the cop cam call when Chad was sitting yes. in the car talking to Emma. Yeah. Uh, that was that was really interesting, and where he said, uh, "I won't be coming back." <laughs> yeah, he knew right that he wasn't going to be coming back anytime yeah. soon. So, what do you make of that? You you can't put yourself. I know you're not going to speak for the other jurors, the ones right. that are that have the responsibility this time around, but. Somebody who has been in that very, very similar uh, situation, listening to very similar information, what do you think they are doing now? They know they're getting ready to move into deliberation very soon. What was that like? What was that thought process like, that, that burden, that responsibility? Tell me about that. Well, first of all, I think they're frustrated at this point. Um, they're sitting there through all of this, and it's going on and on, and, and court is ending early, and they're taking days off. and. These people all have lives to get back to. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't choose to be here, um, and they didn't plan to be here. Sure. So it's a little bit hard for them that way. So they're definitely frustrated. They want to get it done. Um, I think the case w was probably proven to them maybe two weeks ago. Right. And, and so that's frustrating. Uh, but now, so in this case, they have the death penalty to consider. Exactly. That so, is different. Yeah, it is definitely different for them. It's going to be hard for them. I'm, I'm concerned for them for sure. Interesting. When you say that, when you're concerned, what do you mean by that? It, it takes more of a toll on you than you realize sitting through a trial like this. Yeah. Um, I, I had no idea the toll it was going to take on me, and I didn't even realize it at the time mm -hmm. um, until after it was over, I think. But for them, add that extra layer of the death penalty, they have that to consider, and that's going to be really hard. Well, and it's also, you know, you talk about the time restraints and the, the uh, you have to sit through another, essentially another mini trial, yeah. you know, and so that's, you're looking at weeks more of, of testimony. And I think um, it, there's a little bit of an emotional change there because it is more about mitigating factors and it's going right. to be people trying to um you know again tie more to the emotional aspect of who is this person and does he deserve right. does he deserve to continue to live or does he deserve the death penalty and so that is a different it's not so black and white it's not so much evidence-based but more it, playing on the emotions it really causes you to think more deeply about things that you might have thought you had your mind made up about yeah. until you're actually confronted with it Mm -hmm. And that makes it a lot harder. Do you think for jurors in the Lori Vallow case, was it easier or was there some, a little bit more of that finality knowing that you didn't have to worry about the, the sentencing phase? Well, I, yeah. And I think that by the time the trial was over, I, just speaking for myself, I can't really speak for the rest of the jurors. Sure. Um, but, you know, the case was nailed down. I had no doubt. There yeah. was such a mountain of evidence and it was all circumstantial. There wasn't, there wasn't like, there was no smoking gun. There wasn't one thing you could point to and say, this is why I think she's guilty. But the mountain of evidence proved to me that she was guilty. And I had absolutely, I, I didn't deliberate. I was one of the alternates, as it turned out. Okay. The way that works, if you do, don't know, is yes. there are six alternates, and you don't know who those alternates are going to be until right before the jury goes in for deliberations. Right. So what was that like, finding out <laughs> that you had, you were you were sure, you felt very certain, and now all of that to say, right. step aside, we have our 12. So my experience as a juror, you're so confined for so long, and it takes so much, you're trying to keep up, you're trying to understand, and it's a really hard case to understand. And by the time, I had so much invested by the time it came to that, yeah. and they pulled my number out of the hat and I was released, and at the moment, I was really frustrated. It felt unfair, yeah. um, you know, just for me personally, and I sure. knew it wasn't about me. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, I was a little relieved that I was free. Yeah. Just all of a sudden, I was like, oh, I'm done with this. I can walk away now, right. and I can talk about it. <laughs> yeah, so. but to, feel, to have that much invested, I can only imagine it, it felt a little bit like a letdown, meaning that it all for not. not well, not only that, but also, you know, I felt very strongly that she was guilty and I wanted to make sure that yeah. it went that way. So right. I was on pins, pins and needles like everybody else waiting for the verdict. Have you, have you had a chance to talk to any of the other jurors uh, to understand kind of what that was like? And they were in deliberation for what, less than 24 hours, I believe, right. or uh, right at a day. Um, is that on purpose? If, if they're so certain, is there an element of wanting to make sure and, and spend the time that they need just to be yeah. sure they have it right? Yeah, I did. I have talked to jurors. Some of them I've become really good friends with, but the jurors that were there for the deliberations, and I, I can't say a whole lot about sure. it, but I can say it was seven hours. 
And the only reason I think that it was seven hours is they wanted to be really thorough in going mm -hmm. back through the evidence and the judge's instructions. Yeah. Um, so they took their time doing that just to make sure that they got it right. Right. So the 24 hours, yes, to, you know, included the time that they were eating and the time they were sleeping, yeah. right? And yeah. They at, at one point they all felt really tired and just decided, you know, it's time to go home and come back and fresh in the morning yeah. and do this. Yeah. So that responsibility that you know that now these the Daybell uh, jury is feeling um, has anything in this in this trial? You've sat there. You said every single day. You've missed a couple of hours here and there, but for the most part, from start to finish, is there anything in this trial that you think might cause any sort of uh, question? Are there? Do you think it's less straightforward? You said her trial was so straightforward. Do you feel like this one is equally so? I do. I think it's equally so. I don't think there's anything that the defense came up with that is going to put any doubt in any. Well, you never know. There could be just one sure. juror, but I don't. I don't see anything that would cause that. Okay, and that's the other thing that we. I didn't. You know, we talked about um, the Greg Hampiki, and I mentioned that at the start start of the show. This forensic DNA expert. Um, did you feel like he offered anything that you were surprised by, or is it ex what you expected to hear? I found it really nice just to listen to that guy. I would love to sit through one of his classes. Yeah. But, uh, and it was very interesting, but I don't think it contributed anything to the defense's case. Mm -hmm. I, if, if it was, I missed it. Right. Yeah, and I, I can only speculate, right, as we watch it, we're only, we're only able to just assume or, or to make assessments based on what we're hearing, and it seemed like trying to somewhat, um, you know, cause a, a doubt perhaps and say right. if he were there, uh, wouldn't wouldn't we be able to see some evidence of that? Right. Hoping that then the juror says, in the absence of that, right. right, you can't put him there. Yeah, and I guess you're right. If there were one spot where there could be doubt, it would be there. But mm -hmm. I just I think the jurors there there's so much other evidence. Yeah. You said you were talking about just the respect you have for the process and respect for. Uh, the police and and for the the system, uh, which is you as a as a layperson, as a member of the community, a jury of our peers. That is what right. the system is really is about. Um, the complexity, the number of witnesses, the different types of evidence presented. Did that surprise you? Did did you have any expectation of what it would be when you started? I had no expectation, and I didn't, really didn't know much at all. I mean, I knew who Lori was. Mm -hmm. um, I knew the kids had been murdered and found in the backyard, but I didn't know who Alex was. I, that's, I knew nothing more than that. Um, mm -hmm. I could recognize her if I saw her because I'd seen her on the news. Right. But that was about it. Then Alex, and that's another one that comes up that I think that will forever probably be the biggest question mark uh, for right. those people watching this trial and who have heard both Lori's trial and Chad Daybell's. That name comes up time and time again. Are there any other huge question marks that you still wish that you could answer? <laughs> so many. <laughs> um, Alex, I would love to have been able to talk to Alex. Yeah. He, he's the one who really knows everything. Yeah. I think he was... He was the uh, the real killer in the whole thing. He he was the yeah. the muscle, right? Whatever you want to call it. But mm -hmm. uh, I would love to talk to so many people. I I have talked to a lot of people. I've talked to the prosecution, the whole team, I, and in the Lori Vallis sure. case, and I've talked to some of the detectives. Um, I've talked to every family member, anybody who knows anybody in this case, as much as I can, mm -hmm. and I'm still in that process. Yeah. Um, but there's so many answers. The whole inner circle. You know, people like Melanie Gibb. Right. Uh, Melanie, Melanie Boudreaux. Boudreau, mm -hmm. uh, I think she's, I think she was following in Lori's footsteps, mm -hmm. uh, going after her own husband in the way that Lori, Lori did. And so. Yeah. It's a fascinating story. And I mean, goodness, that probably one of the most um, complex and convoluted yeah. stories, you know, we've, we've have to map out truly who's connected to whom and, and all of the different pieces and parts. But what do you hope ultimately in writing a book and, and writing a second book, what's you said you want something good to come from this so what is that what's the best case scenario here right two things really one thing I wanted to do something that helps children um, there are children in need there are tr children that are physically and mentally traumatized um, it's, it's going on all the time so I wanted to do something to help them so proceeds from my book are going to Hope House and they're a really good organization that Wonderful. does exactly that mm -hmm. um, 
The other thing I want to get out of is I want to try to make some awareness that this is going on. Yeah. Um, it's still going on. There are still people out there that maybe not quite as crazy as <laughs> Chad mm -hmm. and Lori. They still have weird beliefs. Sure. And are doing harmful things. And that's really, I think, the last thing I want to talk to you about is that idea that the manipulation, and, and we had to assume, uh, I know we talked about that very early on in the Lori Fallow cases, we had to assume that the, the best uh, defense for either was uh, simply to point the finger at the other person. Um, right. and, and yet Lori, even down to her sentencing, I believe, was adamant and shook her head no and was very, what appeared to be very defensive and very supportive of Chad. Yeah. Um, here in this case, you've heard the defense attorneys talk about, the defense attorney talk about um, Chad not being the person in charge. And in fact, I think painted uh, Tammy right. as kind of the, the one who ran the show. And, and Lori was the one who came on to him and manipulated him. Are you buying that? Or how do you, how do you think that, that played out? Not very well. The defense has been a disaster. I mean, I think John Pryor has done the best he can, and I don't think it's his fault. I just think that there's no way to defend Chad. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's tried, but all the witnesses um, have either been incredible or they had nothing really to offer in Chad's defense. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried to talk to Lori or Chad himself? I have tried to talk to Lori okay. when she was in prison in Pocatello. Yeah. Um, I put an application and I heard nothing back. Okay. I, I don't ever expect to. And people think maybe I shouldn't do that. And, and I don't want to do it, and, and right. it creeps me out in a mm -hmm. huge way, but I think it would be really informative, possibly. Right. Be interesting not, to what you would hear, right? Yeah, and it's not that she's going to tell me the truth about anything, but sure. I might get to know her a little better. <laughs> right. Better understand. It would be yeah. very interesting. I think I can't help but think what she's feeling or, or knowing, you know, as this trial plays out, um, yeah. kind of where she is in her, her thought process. And, and of course, uh, who knows, over the years, she will spend the rest of her natural life in yeah. prison. Uh, and so p potentially, you know, maybe we'll hear from her right. later on. Of course, you will stay and you will continue to watch uh, this trial as it plays out. And uh, so we will also continue to watch and we will be there. Um, and, and we so appreciate your insight and, and being here with us on Inside the Courtroom. We will keep you all updated. We expect this uh, case to go to the jury to, for deliberations by next week. Uh, and we will keep you here, uh, keep you updated here on Inside the Courtroom. So continue to watch.